Hello, and welcome to the month of Spooky 2021. Scary stories are a part of life. We've been telling them since the dawn of man over campfires, radio broadcasts, television, and these days, social media. They remind us of our own mortality, get our adrenaline going, and send chills through our bodies that, well, we just can't explain. During this month, you can expect the unexpected, hear the unbelievable, and witness stories that will stretch your imagination. Why? Because that is what we do here at Ron's Amazing Stories. So settle in for the spooky and be prepared to be taken away from today. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by the 2021 Month of Spooky. While these 5-Minute Gems are never spooky, we here at Ron's Amazing Stories are compelled to bring them to you each and every week. At what price? That, my British friend, is a very good question. Agreed. Hello? Mr. Barron, this is Ed Chavers. Uh, hello, Constable. I've got some mighty unpleasant news for you, Mr. Barron. Carter Hogue, the high school principal, has been murdered. What? I'll have to ask you to come down to the office for a few minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask you some questions. Of course, Constable. I'll be right over. Constable, this is all a tremendous shock to me. Not only was Carter Hogue my colleague at the school, but one of my best friends as well. I know, Mr. Byrne. It's been a shock to us all. How did it happen? As far as I know, someone crept in through the window of Hogue's house and struck him over the head as he sat in his study. Any clues? I don't want. What I wanted to ask you was if you have any idea as to who could have had a motive for killing him. The only thing I can think of is the threat made by Darrell Lewis's father when he found out that Carter had hit his son. Uh, You heard about that. Bad business hitting that boy. I was there when it happened. The boy provoked the incident by his surly behavior. But it was unfortunate that Carter lost his temper. That's the only clue I have, so I called Mr. Lewis on the phone right after you. You ought to be here any minute. This all seems like a horrible dream, Constable. You can count on me to help in any way I can. Thank you, Mr. Barron. I will. Come in. Good evening, Constable. I'm Darrell Lewis's father. Come in, please. Any idea why I sent for you? Eh, a little. You must have heard about the threat I made to the principal when I found out he hit my kid. Uh, That was a dangerous thing to say. I lost my head. Hogue had no right to lay a hand on my kid. Mr. Lewis, Carter Hogue is dead. Murdered. Dead? Now, 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 see here. I know what you're thinking, but and you're dead wrong. I'm innocent. You're protesting your innocence rather loudly, Mr. Lewis. Now, look here, Mr. Barron. I'm not the polished gentleman you are, but I can still protect my rights. Doesn't look good for you, my friend. When you threaten to kill a man and then two days later he's murdered, it's more than coincidence. You better close your mouth, teacher, or I'll do it for you. Perhaps I'd better. I don't want to have you sneaking up on me and smashing in my skull with a bookend like you did to poor Carter Hogue. Why, you dirty... Easy there, Mr. Lewis, easy. You stop this cross-examining, Baron. There'll be plenty of time for it in the courtroom at your trial. What? You killed Carter Hogue, and I can prove it. How does Constable Ed Chevers know that Sam Barron is the murderer of Carter Hogue? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Ron, why do we put ourselves through this insidious torture each and every week? Well, because it is the signature of the show. The five-minute mystery represents what we do here to promote the art of storytelling. I see. Do you? There are many forms of storytelling, oral, digital, and written, and the medium used is often reflective of the people telling the stories. So in other words, you have no freaking idea why we do this either. That would be true. And now, back to our story. 
Unfortunately for you, Mr. Barron, in your attempt to pin the murder on Mr. Lewis here, you became too dramatic in describing the scene and the action. How did you know that Hogue had been struck with a bookend? I didn't tell you, and you hadn't seen the body. Only the man who committed the murder could have known what the weapon was. You protested Mr. Lewis's guilt too loudly, Mr. Barron. You only proved him innocent. Well, that solution actually makes some sense. Assuming that the detective didn't mention the book end, then, yes, that would clear the boy's father. However, it could all be a misdirection. May I remind you that they only have five minutes? You can, but I'm still going to hyperbolically criticize them. Is that even a word? I'm not really sure. Welcome to the podcast. This is the month of Spooky 2021, and we have so much to get to this month that it will make your head spin. Wow, you hired the exorcist. That's great. No, no, nothing like that. I just mean it's a lot of stuff. This month, we will have a ghost story with Sylvia that will focus on a prankster ghost boy then Sylvia and I will sit down and listen to the classic Halloween story called The Thing on the Forbal Board. We will have some of the best stories ever from you guys that should curl your toes. Wizard of Oz reference! Yep, just like that. And on today's show, we debut one of the top 30 scariest radio broadcasts of all time, with a story called Whence Came You. It all begins right now with this Clive Barker special review by Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? Clive Barker's First Tales, narrated by Simon Vance. Clive Barker is one of the prominent contemporary English writers of our time. Besides writing, he is recognized for his creative input in the domain of filmmaking, screenwriting, and even video game designing. His forte, though? The genre of horror. First Tale are two of Clive's very first writing endeavors. The audiobook begins with Wood on the Hill, which is the short story about a middle-class woman who soon learns a terrifying lesson about her complete disregard for anyone other than herself. The second tale, Candle in the Cloud, one of my personal favorites, is a novella of dark fantasy that follows three children who discover a magic candle that transports them to a world where a plague cloud is destroying everything in its wake. Here's a clip from that story. It was a cold day in early January. The sky had threatened snow since the first grey light of morning, but so far only a few dismal flakes had drifted down, powdering the crazy paving in the garden and then hardening into crusty ice. 
The birds sat silently on the bare branches of the apple tree, looking chilly and miserable. Occasionally one of them would fly down and peck vainly at the frozen soil, then, giving it up as a bad job, flutter up into the apple tree again. The iron sky frowned, and the day was long and heavy. "'I wish it would snow,' muttered Graham, half to himself. Mrs. Bedford, his mother, stood at the sink, peeling potatoes and looking out into the garden. "'Heaven preserve us if it does. Your father will get his twinges again, and then where will we be? We're supposed to be going to your Auntie Stella's on Sunday.' "'Oh, no. Oh, yes. What are you pulling faces for now? I thought you liked going to Auntie Stella's. You hardly ever see them. It's Mandy. What's wrong with Mandy? She's growing into a proper young lady. Yeah, she's a snob. All she ever talks about is riding school and the boys she met at the tennis club. Oh, really, Graham? Anyway, I'm fed up. I wish I was back at school. Oh, no, I don't. We'd be doing physics now. Hey, it's beginning to snow. Oh, my goodness, your father'll go mad. Here, take the peelings up to the top of the garden, will you, dear? Hurry up before he comes on heavy. Yes, mum. Put your shoes on, you'll get your slippers wet. Yes, mum. And put your anorak on, too. I'm only going— You heard me. Yes, mum. Graham slipped on his old anorak and took the dripping colander from his mother. Don't dawdle up there. There's half a blizzard coming up. Graham slammed the kitchen door behind him. And don't slam the door. Really, that boy— She dried her hands and went into the front room. The path was slippery, and Graham half ran, half slid his way up the garden. His breath hung in misty clouds at his lips. He ducked under the low branches of the apple tree, and as he did so, his anorak became caught in the brambles. For some reason, nobody had bothered to touch the bramble patch this year, and it had already begun to take over the strawberry bed and the lettuce frames. Not that Graham minded— He had always disliked gardens in which the plants were all in neat rows, and the grass was cut just to the right height to see the plastic dwarves. The tangled mass of brambles at the top of the garden made the place look a little more exciting. Indeed, there was something about the twisted thicket against the dark sky that was a little frightening. But today it was just annoying. Graham yelled as he scratched the back of his hand on the thorns trying to free his anorak. The colander tipped, and the peelings were scattered all over the path. Damn! He pulled at his anorak in a sudden fit of anger, and it tore. Oh, blimey, now I've done it. Freed, he examined the damage to his hand and his anorak, neither of which was irreparable, and bent down to pick up the spilt peelings. Suddenly, something moved behind him. At first he thought it was a cat, or even a bird, in the brambles, but from the way the entire mesh of brambles was shaking, it seemed to be a bigger animal than that. He stopped gathering up the peelings and stood up, watching. The sky had darkened, the snow was falling more heavily than ever. Curious and not a little unnerved by the horrid stillness that had fallen, Graham scanned the bramble patch, not moving a muscle in case he frightened whatever it was away. Nothing. The patch was absolutely still. Wait. There, in the thickest, darkest part of the patch, His eyes met the gaze of another two eyes, large and shining. Graham drew a quick breath with surprise. He knew the eyes were human. They looked back at him with intelligence and not a little enmity. His first thought was to turn and run for it, but suppose he got caught in the brambles again and whoever it was jumped from their hiding place and caught him. On the other hand, he could hardly stand there and gaze like an idiot at the mysterious eyes until one of them froze to death. So he said in a very low and hoarse voice. Who are you? No answer. Clive Barker's first tales are the first ever written by Clive. They are offered for the very first time by Audible. Their production has been lovingly supervised by Clive himself to ensure that these are not just mere books, but works of art to be cherished. First Tales is sure to delight anyone, from his longtime fans to first-time listeners. And you can have his book today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with brand new titles. 
To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get your free audiobook today. And let me tell you, the candle in the cloud is worth it. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. This time on These Are Your Stories, we have new ones and old ones. Also, we have a theme. All of these took place on Halloween. They say that that night is when the veil between the spirit realm and our world is very thin. If these stories are any indication, then I think that just might be true. Our first story comes from Tyson Bradley, who lives in Tampa, Florida. He has titled this one, The Man Who Wasn't There. Ron, I love Halloween, but after this experience, I tend to take it a bit more seriously. One Halloween a few years ago, I was coming home late after a All Hallows' Eve party. It was quite dark around 3 in the morning. At the time, I was living in an apartment where they had an elevator. I got in the elevator, and when the door was about to close, a strange man with a hoodie entered. He apologized for scaring me and asked which floor I was heading to. Without making eye contact, I told him. The man casually pressed the button and one below. On the way, he asked to use my cell phone. I declined and felt a cold shiver go through my body. I stepped a bit more away from the man and isolated myself in the corner. After a few seconds of silence, the elevator arrived at the floor below mine. The guy slowly walked out of the door and turned around to face me. He just stared at me without any movement holding the door open. Finally, he let it go and it slowly started to close. From the gap, I could see him turning around, heading for the upstairs, pulling a knife out of his pocket. When I arrived at my floor, I saw the man coming towards me at a very fast pace. I remember screaming at him to stop and close my eyes. After several seconds, nothing happened. However, there was this freaky cold chill that passed right through me. I looked up, and there was no one there. Tyson Bradley, Tampa, Florida. Wow, Tyson, that sent chills through me as I read it. I can't imagine how I would feel after that. I do know that I might consider taking the stairs for a while. Thank you for sharing your story. This next one was told to me by Mary Campbell from Mission City, California. I tried to find that on the map, and the best I can do is say that it must be a suburb of San Diego. Mary said that this event has scarred me for life, and I have looked for explanations, but they all remain unsatisfactory. She has titled her story, The Home Invasion. When I was a child, I was scared of the dark. I swore to my mother I heard voices in it. They were not evil, but they were not familiar, so they scared me. It was not uncommon in the middle of the night for me to wake up and hear these whispers. My mom figured that they were just bumps in the night and typical kids' nightmare material. I often tried to explain to her that it was more than that, that they sounded different from one another. On some nights, I would get so scared from these whispers that I would sleep in my mom's bed with her. It was an added bonus that the bathroom was directly outside her bedroom door for any late-night trips. I should also add at this point that when walking out into the hall to go to the bathroom, you look directly down the stairs that would lead you to our living room. It was Halloween night. 
we had had a wonderful evening collecting candy with both tricks and treats. We went to bed late. I awoke and had to go to the restroom. I walked out of the door and distinctly heard the phrase, Look! And to my astonishment, a red light, almost like a spotlight, was cast on the floor at the very bottom of the stairs. The light had no other source. It was by itself, and I was transfixed by it. Being a little kid, and it was Halloween, I knew exactly what the light was. It was the Great Pumpkin. I had just watched the Charlie Brown special the night before, and I was so excited that I began to walk down the stairs to greet him. After about the third step, the light began to fade into the darkness of my living room. That's when I heard him. A very strong, masculine voice, different from the first one, and not at all like my dad. It said, Stop! Right now! Go back up those stairs! I listened and turned around. I heard a very loud crash that sent me running back up the stairs into my mother's bed where I jumped straight under the covers and stayed the rest of the night. When we awoke the next morning, the spider lights that my mom had put on the railing down the stairs were in a pile on the bottom. Some of the lights were broken from what must have been a very strong pole. The dry sink in the living room had fallen from the wall. My mother couldn't explain it. My father was worried that we had been victims of a home invasion. My little sister, well, she was crying. Nothing was missing, the doors were all sealed, and there was no explanation for what had happened. That's when I saw it, and I kept quiet about it. I was so afraid that I could not force words out of my mouth. On the wooden edge of the dry sink were three indentations where something had gripped it very tightly. Something down here had grabbed it and had thrown the sink down. I was terrified. I don't like to think about what was waiting downstairs for me that Halloween, if anything at all, but I can tell you the reality was that something had physically acted upon those lights and the dry sink. After that event, I never heard another whisper again, which is sad because in some ways I would have liked to thank the man that had stopped me from going down those stairs. Mary from Mission City. That is another crazy Halloween tale that has no explanation. I don't know what you heard, saw, or felt but I do know that it would have sent me running for cover as well. Thank you for sharing your story, Mary. That one is amazing. Our last story is a brand new one from Valerie Alexis Barnes, who lives near Canterbury, somewhere in the United Kingdom. She has titled her story, The Halloween Ghost. The British have long celebrated Guy Fawkes Day on November 5th, but now October 31st is a lot more appealing. In England, Halloween is so very hot right now. Houses and shops are decorated with images of witches, pumpkins, and Michael Myers. Here is Valerie's Tale. It was Halloween evening and I was around 10 years old. I'm 18 now. I was standing in our living room with my friends and brothers. There were five of us, all watching out the window, waiting for late-arriving trick-or-treaters. It was dark outside, around eight in the evening, when we saw a blue glowing figure floating up the road. I remember thinking about a classic cartoon ghost, like the one you'd see in Mario but part of me also remembers an old 17th century man in nightwear. I think this is because that's what my brother saw, and it has changed my perception over the years. Anyway, it walked, or floated, up the road for about 10 meters and then vanished behind a streetlight. We were all baffled. The weird thing is, 
that I can't remember anything before or after, just when we saw it. I've tried to ask the others what they remember, and they too can only recall the single event. My twin brother and I remember it clearly, and it shakes us up every single time we speak about it. This is the only paranormal experience I've ever had in my life, but it has made me believe in it all. Valerie Alexis Barnes from Canterbury Well, Valerie, that is an odd tale, and with so many witnesses, it's impossible to refute. Was it a ghost or just a blue glowing man in a nightshirt? I'm going with the ghost idea. Thank you for your story. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share like Valerie did, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com and click on the story submission banner. Leave your story, give it a title, and tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story this week is creepy. Are you a fan of the old Egyptian mummy tale? You know, when the monster is awoken and brought back to complete some insidious plan or maybe for just a bloodthirsty rage of terror? Well, that is not what we have for you today. Nope, we have the other side of the story that takes creepy to a whole new level. It comes from the mind of Willis Cooper and the OTR series, Quiet Please. It is listed as one of the top 30 scariest radio broadcasts of all time. It is titled, Whence Came You? and should not be listened to with the lights off. It first aired on February 16th, 1948, and I think you better be ready to have your dreams disturbed. Quiet, please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Whence Came You? I came from Jerusalem. I've traveled in East a good deal in the last 20-odd years, and I flatter myself that I know my way around. So when I got off the plane at Cairo, I didn't start for the camp right away as a good storybook archaeologist would have done. I made a beeline for Shepherd from the room I'd left a couple of days before when I went to Jerusalem. The bath, the gin and tonic, and the large batch of mail from the States. <laughs> what more can a man ask? In Cairo on a hot night? But of course it was too good to last. I do get around, don't I? <laughs> Listen, this is gin and tonic. How are you? Well, I'm fine, but come in. <laughs> well, sit down. You're the last man in the world that I... Here, take a gin and tonic before I drop it. <laughs> well, look, I'm... <laughs> look, I'm in spades, eh? <sighs> By golly, I'm glad to see you, boy. <laughs> I'm glad to see you. I've been looking here for three days waiting for you to come back. Hey, you look skinnier. Will you go out and dig holes out there for six months, lad? You'll take off some of that fat, too. <laughs> Me fat? <laughs> go away, you're kidding. 
Well, get your shirt on and let's go see the town. Sit down. Come on, what you doing here? <sighs> business. Yeah, what kind of business? Newspaper business, Natch. What's cooking in the Middle East and stuff? <sighs> Say, uh, how do you get more of these things? We'll get on the bar in a minute. They're colder down there. Well, go on, go on. Tell me about it. Well, you know, Eddie Heffercamp just called me in and said, draw some dough and go east and send up some stuff for the Sunday feature section. The trip's making a monkey out of us again. So I remember the dear old days on the Midway, you and me, and you're around here, so let's go see the town, huh? Well, I'll be darned. When did you leave Chicago? Day before yesterday. Oh, boy. Yep, the loop's still there. They still got the Burlicue shows on South State Street. The Michigan Avenue Bridge is always up. The Cubs are in seventh place. Now? Now what? Now we go see the town? Come on, put on your pants. <laughs> You've never been in Cairo before, have you? Me? Not me. Why? Well, if you had, you wouldn't care much about seeing it, my boy. Yeah? Yeah. But, uh, women. You had a good look at any of them? <laughs> have I? Oh, boy. <laughs> what? <laughs> the one that's waiting for you downstairs. Waiting for me? Wow. What are you talking about? I don't know any women in Cairo. Well, there's one who knows you. Why, you're crazy. I'm telling you. How do you know? She's been waiting down there for three days. I've seen her. What's she look like? Oh, boy. Not a native. Cleopatra. Is this one of your bump jokes, Abe? I give you my word of honor. I don't get it. Come on downstairs and you will. So we went downstairs. British colonels, American traveling salesmen, Egyptian army officers. A fee for two, a bevy of the ugliest women in the world. And I don't see any woman waiting for me. There, by the door to the bar. And I looked. And there by the door stood the one most beautiful woman I have ever seen in all my life. She was no Egyptian native. She might have descended from one of the marvelously lifelike paintings of the queen of the Hathor dynasty that I'd seen on the walls of tombs 2,000 years old. How can I describe her? I see her eyes were black. Her hair was black and cut in the manner of the days of the shepherd kings that ruled the valley of the Nile a thousand years before the pyramids were built. Red lips that smiled at me slowly. I felt my knees tremble as she looked into my eyes. Come on, let's go ask her if she's got a friend. And when I looked back at her... Where'd she go? It was midnight, and then one o'clock, and two, and then three. We still walked the streets of Cairo. The waning moon was rising in the northeast behind our shoulders as we turned our steps back to the hotel. Twice I thought I'd seen her, and twice she, if she it was, disappeared into a narrow winding street where we couldn't follow. No, I never followed women about the streets of a foreign city before, not in all my life. Well, there's little enough of that in the life of an archaeologist. The women we followed died a thousand... 10,000 years before we were born. We know them only by the portraits painted on the walls of a musty tomb. By what we find in great hermetically sealed stone caskets, wrapped in rust-colored linen and smelling of the ghost of cinnamon and myrrh and spikenard. I don't know why I did this. I know. She wanted you to come after her. That's ridiculous, eh? I heard her ask for you. Well, what would she want of me? <laughs> what does a pretty gal usually want of a guy? Drinks, something to eat, a good time? Well, she could have had that from anybody. Yeah, me, for instance. But she wanted you, Austin. Well, why? Maybe she's a spy or something. A spy? Maybe she wanted to sell you something. You know, you grave robbers. Maybe she knows where some old pharaoh or somebody is planted. Yeah, that could be, I suppose. Yeah, well, I'm for bed. i got to get out to the diggings early. Fine night we had. Forget it. You got a room, huh? Yeah, right down the hall. Well, knock on my door when you get up. All right. Good night. Night. Say, they uh, have this incense all the time around this place, huh? What do you mean? 
Don't you smell it? Smells like a funeral. I don't. Oh. Yeah, I suppose. Night. Night, Austin. I could have told him what the incense was. I've smelled cinnamon and myrrh and spikenard too often not to recognize it instantly. When I opened the door to my room, the smell was almost overpowering, used as I am to the funeral spices of ancient Egyptian tombs. No. No, I'm not going to tell you what it is. That a beautiful Egyptian princess of the days of Hyksos was waiting for me in the darkness. This isn't a ghost story. It's a true story. There wasn't anyone in the room. I turned on the lights. Opened the window. There wasn't anyone in the room. So I went to bed. Dreamed about sailing on Lake Michigan. The storm came up and the thunder crashed. And I was scared to death. Then I woke up and the thunder was the servant knocking on my door, bringing me my morning cup of tea. Abe and I got in my Jeep and rode out to the excavation. It's quite a distance from Cairo. So never mind just where it is because that's my business. And the university's. That right rear tire went flat, just as I've been expecting. I forgot to put air in the spare, so we took quite a while getting it pumped up. It was late in the afternoon when we got there. Abe had never seen anything of this sort. You see, Abe, these places are built one on top of another. Almost every village and town in the east is. Oh, different periods of time, huh? Yeah, that's right. There may be any number of cities built above the ruins of another. All we do is dig out the top when you see, recover everything we can that's of historical importance, then go on carefully down to the next. What do you do with the stuff that's on top? It has to be destroyed, naturally. Well, gee, that's too bad, ain't it? Well, we make careful records, photographs. And then you just peel off the stuff and go on to the next. That's right. This is the fourth city from the top we're working on now. Uh, see those big, that big pile of rubble over there? Yeah. That's the remains of the other three cities. Gee, that seems a shame. All those years of work and living and everything? Well, we save artifacts, of course. Uh, save what? No, uh, things that people made, pot shards, fragments of wall painting, decorations, that sort of thing. Uh, what do you do with the uh, people you find? People? Yeah. Oh, well, mummies, uh, various things. We read the inscriptions, decide whether the fellow is important enough to investigate further. The Egyptian government has a great deal to say about the contents of tombs, you know. Uh, Find any gold? Not here so far, but we probably will. This part where we're standing was the necropolis of this particular city. Uh Huh? The cemetery, you see. Oh, yeah. It's reasonable to suppose that there are other tombs under here. That's where you find the jewels and the golden stuff? Generally, yes. Uh, Say, Austin, why don't you get a steam shovel in here? You'd move this stuff a lot quicker. And probably smash some priceless inscriptions or paintings into bits. No, my boy, we do this gently. Uh-huh. And you can read this stuff, huh? The hieroglyphics? Hieroglyphics comes from two Greek words originally meaning carving by priests. Okay, Professor. Can you read it? Yeah, of course. I can read a good deal of the later writings by sight. When we get down to the real ancient stuff, that's a little more difficult. Uh, what does this say? What? Uh, this slab here. Yeah, let's see. Uh, here was I, Hotep, Presented with a, well, I guess you'd say invested with, the working tools of those who build. In my hand, I, Hotep, did take, uh, took, the tools of the second uh, grade of workmen in stone, the uh, plum. The square and the... The level, huh? How'd you know? There were masons in those days. Well, sure. How do you think they built all this stone stuff? Hey, look at that. What's that there? Uh, it's a name. Uh, Sholem. Uh, it's probably Solomon. 
Yeah, this isn't Solomon's time. Uh, right alongside the name. The middle stone of an arch, which is sacred. The keystone. These fellows didn't know how to build an arch. Well, that's right, they didn't. Why are you so excited about it, though? Hey! What? Uh, look at that. This? Yeah, that's a very fine example of wall painting. Look how the colors are still bright. Look how they... Yeah. You see the same thing I see, don't you? You know what I saw. You know whose portrait was painted on the edge of the slab that came from the tomb that was old in the time of Augustus Caesar? Coincidence or not, here was the face of the woman who waited for me the night before in Shepherd's Hotel. It's amazing how racial characteristics persist through centuries in Egypt. I have seen Egyptian men who might have been Tutankhamun's own brother. I've seen women, but you wouldn't blame me for feeling my hackles rise a little at this uncanny resemblance to the woman who disappeared. I kept smelling myrrh and lichenart cinnamon. But I hadn't much time to think of it then. Martin Weaver, who was in charge of the actual excavation, came up behind us. Well, I'm glad you're back, Or Oh, hello, Martin. How are we doing? Uh, Dave Felden, Martin Weaver. Oh, I am. Hello. Well, the day before yesterday, we broke through a place, Austin, that goes down to the city underneath this one. You did? Yeah, one of the workmen found a big sandstone slab, and we cleared it away completely. I've got the big shears rigged over it now, and I thought we'd wait till you got here to lift the slab. Um... Uh, you want to do it tonight or what? Oh, gosh, let's do it now, Austin. Well, what do you think? Getting dark. Let's have a look at it. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're back. Uh, bring anything to drink with you? We walked half a mile. There was a little clearing at one corner of the necropolis, and the beams of the shears stood stark against the darkening sky. There was something elemental, something deathly about them. It's not an archaeologist's job to be sentimental or superstitious. None of us would stay on the job very long if we were. But the half-inch steel cable was attached to a block of stone. It was the only thing that separated us from something that happened perhaps 40 centuries ago. And well, there are times when a man's entitled to shiver a little in the wind that rises over the desert at sunset. Abe was beside himself with excitement. Let's pull it up, Austin. Go on, let's pull it up, huh? Go ahead, Martin. Okay. Glad we got the engine. That slab weighs about 70 tons. Go ahead. A little higher. Gosh! <laughs> the air foot down there. <laughs> That air you're breathing, Abe, was breathed by pharaohs long before Moses let his people out of this country. Gee. Okay, hold it, Martin. Right. Uh, you, you going down there, Austin? Tomorrow. Oh, not now. No, no, it's late. Oh, gee, I'd like to go down there. We will in the morning. Uh, how is it? Let's take your flashlight. Yeah. yeah mummy case, some wall paintings. Let me see. Take the flashlight. Oh. Boy, oh boy. It isn't far down there. I'm going to jump down. No, 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 wait. Don't do that. I'll be all right. Now, don't go running all over that place, tracking it up, Abe. I won't wait. Back down here. Get a ladder, Martin. Yeah, okay. You hear me, Abe? I hear you. Throw me your flashlight. Oh, gone it. That's the last time you. Here. Now, stand still. I'm standing still. Hey, Austin. What? There's a picture on the wall. What picture? Over here on the wall, wall Brandon. I dropped the light. Well, stand still. Martin will be back in a minute with his light. Austin. What? There's something in here. Well, be careful. It might be a snake. No, it, it ain't a snake. It's ah! Oh. Abe. Abe. Abe, what happened? Look out, Austin, look out, the slab! We worked 
all night long, Martin and I, splicing that steel cable and raising the heavy slab that had imprisoned Abe in that place of the dead. We had no hope, but what could we do? A miracle might have happened. There might have been a chink between the slab and the opening it covered, an opening through which a few breaths of air might have seeped into the tomb. The snake might not have bitten them. He might have killed it. So we told each other all through the night. The stubborn cable cut our hands and defied our every effort. The sun was just rising when we at last had made it fast, and Martin started the engine. And we fastened the rope onto the cable, and we swung the great stone slab aside. I was down in the tomb almost before it had cleared the opening. It was too late. I nearly sickened as I called to Martin. He jumped out. Oh, my good... What happened to him? I thought it was a snake. No snake did that. No. I saw a pigeon once that a hawk had been at. We... We'd have been too late even if the slab hadn't fallen. Well... Boston. What? That mummy case. Was the cover off it last night when you looked at it? No. Why, Abe couldn't have. That lid weighs ten tons. Then we looked down into the stone coffin. I hope I shall never see the like of that again. What is it? The mummy of a man. A tall man. In a robe of gold cloth. Not wrapped in linen bindings, just a robe of gold cloth with strange symbols woven into the cloth. And his head. Not a man's head. The head of a hawk. No, not a mask. We look carefully. A man with a head of a hawk. And the hawk's beak. All dabbled with red. I didn't believe it either. It couldn't be. But it was. It was the father of all the Egyptian gods, Osiris. Osiris, the brother husband of Isis, the founder of the world's first empire. Osiris, who was murdered 16,000 years ago. And his body was hidden by Isis, his wife, with a blasting curse on any who might find his tomb. It was impossible. It couldn't be. But there it was. And Martin and I and the dead man were there in his tomb with him. And the curse hung heavy in the musty air around us. And then the first rays of the sun reflected from something above us stole down into the tomb. And I saw the pictures on the wall. I saw Osiris with his hawk's head. And the robe he wore and the mitre on his hawk's head was the same that the mummy wore in the casket. I saw Isis, his wife, weeping over the body of her murdered husband. And the beauty of the work of the long dead artist was unbelievable. And I saw another picture. There was the daughter of Isis and Osiris. Yes? Yes, of course I could read the inscriptions. Yes. Of course I could recognize her face. I had seen it before in the lobby of Shepherd's Hotel. Inscriptions on the wall were terrifying. There were secrets there that men would give their lives to possess today. There were secrets there that we've only begun to imagine today. I'm a scientist, I know. Or do I? We forgot the thing in the coffin. We we forgot the thing on the floor. And it grew darker and darker in the tomb. And I read on and on. I stood before the painting of the one who was Osiris' daughter. Long black hair. Red.
red lips that smiled at me. And my heart stopped at the inscription under the portrait. I read it over again. Be not afraid. Ah, whose pen? Carved into the living rock in the ancient heretic characters uncounted centuries ago. Not by the hand of the artist. I knew who had carved my name there. Be not afraid, Austin. And I wasn't afraid at all when I discovered that the thing that was making a dock down there was a great slab of sandstone slowly swinging around and down to imprison us all in the tomb that the white of Osiris had cursed. Martin Weaver was a very brave man. Martin Weaver didn't scream and cry in the heavy dark. Martin Weaver talked to me quietly. It'll be all right, Austin. The workmen will be here before long, and they'll see the slab, and Ibrahim knows how to run the engine. I hope so, Martin. I hope they'll be in time. They'll be in time. He'll start the engine and pull the thing off all right. I hope so, Martin. Sure. They'll know that something's wrong. Where are you? Right here. Well, stand still. I am standing still. I thought I heard you move. No. Oh. You afraid, Austin? Are you? Not particularly. But I... going? I haven't moved. I thought I felt your hand on my arm. No. Sit still. Don't use up the air. Well, you sit still. I tell you, I didn't move. Something's moving. It couldn't be. Martin? What? <sighs> Martin. Martin. Martin! Answer me, Martin! And there was nothing but silence. And then another footstep. And I felt a hand on my arm and I screamed with terror. But it was a gentle hand and it led me gently away from where I stood in the dark. And I followed. I hit my head on a solid stone wall. My feet dragged as I followed whoever it was through a door that I knew couldn't be there. And a voice breathed in my ear. Oh, and I smelled cinnamon and myrrh and spike and art. And I followed on. And soon there was a glimmering of light ahead of me and I felt the hand release my arm. And I walked on toward the light. Then, in a little while, another little room hewn out of the solid rock. And a light burning. A little bronze lamp at the head of a mummy case of lacquered painted wood. And the portrait image on the lid of the sarcophagus. The same face. The smile. And I came closer to read the inscription I knew would be there. An inscription put there so many, many years ago. I have freed you. My hand went to the fastening of the lid. When I looked up to the wall above, the portrait again. But with a difference. The same costume, the same jewelry, the same headdress. But the head was the head of a hawk. The head of Osiris' daughter. So I sit here, and the little bronze lamp is flickering low.
Martin Weaver with Don Briggs. As usual, the original music for Quiet Please is composed and played by Albert Berman. Now, for a word about next week's Quiet Please, here is my good friend, our writer director, Willis Cooper. I've got a story for you next week called Put on the Dead Man's Coat. It's about a man who had an idea that wasn't good for him. Put on the Dead Man's Coat. The title of next week's Quiet Please. And so until next week at this time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet, please, comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Would you open the tomb, knowing whence came you? Egyptians believed that the hawk had protective powers and links with royalty. Ruler of the skies, they protected the earth with their wings. Hawks were often depicted hovering over the pharaoh's head. Horus, the god of sky, had a hawk or falcon's head. So as you can see, the folks at Quiet Please did their research on this one. What a truly amazing story, and the stuff of nightmares. Quiet Please was a radio fantasy and horror program created by Willis Cooper, also known for creating Lights Out. Ernest Chappell was the show's announcer and lead actor. Quiet Please debuted in 1947 on the Mutual Broadcasting System, and its last episode was broadcast June 25, 1949 on ABC. Quiet Please has been praised as one of the finest efforts of the golden age of radio. The extraordinary body of work was exceptionally well written and outstandingly acted. Later, during the month of Spooky, we will present another one of their stories, The Thing on the Forval Board, which, by the way, is also listed in the top 30 scariest radio broadcasts of all time. See you then. coming and that was episode number 511 the spirits want to thank tyson bradley mary campbell and valerie alexis barnes for helping us out today so very cool if you want to follow the podcast or the blog head to ronsamazingstories.com there you will find any of the links i mentioned and how to contact us do you want to help the show the best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.